Potsy has seen some of the country's most powerful men and women quizzed by young people about the issues that matter to them. We're on the road again. We're back in the Science Museum, which is appropriate because we've got an actual astronaut here. Tim Peake isn't any old astronaut, though. When he takes off, when he lifts off from Kazakhstan next month, he's going to be the UK's first official spaceman, and he's going to be in space for rather a long time. This is who he's up against. This is the hot seat panel. They'll be asking the questions. They're drawn from first news readers and schools from around the country. Before they get stuck in, though, let's get Tim to introduce himself. Uh, Mr. Peake, who are you, what do you do, and why are you so important? Well, uh, as you say, I'm Tim Peake. I'm an astronaut with the European Space Agency, and I'm British. Um, why is it so important what we do? Well, we're working on an inter international collaboration on the space station. So that's Russia, it's America, it's Europe, it's Jap um, Japan and Canada. And we're doing great scientific work up there. So on with the questions, Megan has the first question. How does it feel to be the first British ESA astronaut to visit the space station? Do you know, I'm, I'm really proud, obviously, to be British. Um, I was very proud in my previous career as a, as a military pilot. Um, and representing the UK within the European Space Agency and within the international space community, it's a, it's a huge honour to, to be there. Hey, Sharon has the next question. Who has been your inspiration? I've been inspired by so many different people throughout various stages of my life. When I was a teenager, I had some great school teachers. I was in the cadet force at school. Um, I was very actively involved in that. Um, and that really set me on the path to becoming a pilot. When I was in the military, I was very lucky to have some great military commanders um, who gave me some good advice and were inspiring to me. Uh, I think in terms of being an astronaut, uh, obviously people like Yuri Gagarin, Neil Armstrong, very inspirational characters. But for me, Bruce McCandler stands out as the first astronaut to ever do an untethered EVA from the back of the, the space shuttle. And I think from a test pilot perspective, that must be an amazing thing to do. And why do you, is he your biggest inspiration? Um, just because uh, I think that you know what he did was really groundbreaking. It was a very high-risk activity, and the level of isolation that he must have felt, you know, being hundreds of meters away from the space shuttle and just him and a jetpack and no cables, no tethers at all, um, you know, that takes that takes a lot of guts to do that. Did you grow up wanting to be an astronaut, or did you become a pilot first and then decide to be an astronaut? I, I grew up wanting to be a pilot. I mean, in my younger years, yes, of course, I wanted to be an astronaut <coughs> like many children do. But as a teenager, I got hooked on aviation um, from being in the cadet force, having the opportunity to fly. And then really, I was very fortunate to be able to realize my passion of becoming a, a military pilot and had a wonderful time uh, flying and subsequently as a test pilot as well. And um, so next question from Elizabeth. About the method you invented for making the perfect cup of tea in zero gravity. <laughs> well, I've yet to test it out, but um, when they gave me my uh, my tea pouch, uh, I looked at it and I thought, well, this is great. It's a pa it's a uh, tea bag inside a foil pouch, and I attach it to the hot water dispenser, and it fills up. The trouble is, of course, if you're spending 10, 15 minutes drinking your cup of tea, as the level goes down, it's going to get stewed and it's going to get stronger and stronger. So the last little bit is really not going to taste very nice at all. So uh, I've come up with a small device that will enable me to transfer my tea once it's brewed into another foil pouch that uh, has nothing in it. And that way I can then spend as long as I like drinking my tea and it won't get stewed uh, and hopefully it won't get cold either. Is there commercial applications for that on Earth, do you think? <laughs> We're going to see the Tim Peake tea cup? Well, funnily enough, one of the NASA astronauts, Don Pettit, who's a brilliant scientist, he actually has developed a space cup and he has studied the surface tension of fluids and, and the angles um, that are required in order to, you know, for tea or coffee to remain in a cup in zero gravity without mm -hmm. spilling out. So we already have space tea cups. <coughs> yeah, that's a Christmas wish list. Um, the next question is Joseph. The What's there. the best thing about being an astronaut? Uh, I think one of the best things about being an astronaut is you get to meet so many interesting people. You train all around the world, Japan, Canada, America, Russia, Europe, and you're working with incredible people from very different backgrounds. It's a really privileged position to be in. That's what I've enjoyed the most is meeting loads of different people. Diana, your question. What was the biggest challenge you had to face while preparing for your six months? Probably the biggest challenge has actually been learning Russian language. Um, I love all the practical training. Uh, I'm very sort of technically minded coming from a, a test pilot background. So the systems training, none of that's bothered me at all. I've loved the spacewalk training. 
um, but put me in a classroom and, and try and teach me Russian language, that's been a struggle. Can you give us any words of Russian now? Когда я полечу в космос, я буду очень горд представлять Великобританию. I didn't understand that. Did anyone get what does that mean? When I fly to space, I'll be very proud to represent Great Britain. That's great. Um, and Leila, your question. Do you know any of the other people who will be up there with you? Do I know the people? Yeah, we've had the benefit of training together as a team for two and a half years. So the people I'll be flying in the Soyuz with, that's Tim Kopra from NASA and Yuri Melenchenko from Russia. We've been working together very closely. And then I'll be working with another three astronauts who are already on board, uh, Scott Kelly from NASA and Misha Kornienko from Russia. They're actually doing a one year stay on board. So when I get up there, they've been there for eight months already. Um, so they're very experienced astronauts. And Sergei Volkov from Russia is up there as well. So we do all know each other, um, which is what helps to make it a fun and sociable environment when we get on board the space station. Before we go for a second round of questions, I've got a couple of readers questions, uh, which I'm just gonna read out as they are written, um, so here we go. Um, a lot of the water you'll drink on the ISS will be recycled from astronaut Wee. Uh, do you think that'll cross your mind when you have your first sip? <laughs> you know, that crossed my mind this morning in London when I had my first sip of tap water as well. But no, I mean, it, seriously, we recycle water here on planet Earth. We do the same on the space station. It's just on the space station, it's a much shorter cycle. Uh, but the water apparently tastes great. Um, and yes, uh, you know, we're now into about 90% of the water is uh, recycled from urine. So it's pretty high, con high volume. Um, okay, and uh, second question from the... Re uh, if you see aliens when you're in space, are you allowed to tell people about it, or would it be top secret and you could only tell the government? Everything we do on the space station is open for public viewing, and you can watch right now NASA TV. You can see the downstreaming from the video from the cameras outside the space station and inside the space station. So, uh, no, we would definitely get on to Houston and let them know what's going on. Little green men out the window, <laughs> probably let them know. Okay, um, Megan, your second question. You list your hobbies as climbing, cross-country running, and triathlon. These rely on open countryside. Have you had to prepare mentally for being inside the limited space of the ISS? Yes, we do. And, um, you know, some things really help you to prepare. I mean, every time you put on a spacesuit and you close the helmet, um, you get used to that feeling of uh, claustrophobic. Thank you. I am not claustrophobic, thankfully enough. But, you know, you get used to that feeling of being in tight, confined, cramped spaces uh, and isolation, really, from the outside world. Um, spending seven days in a cave in Sardinia was, again, another great experience as to how to cope with isolation. Um, spending 12 days underwater off the coast of Florida on NASA's NEMO mission was another experience where I had of that kind of isolation. So we have had uh, training that has helped to prepare us for what's to come. In, in terms of contact with your family, how, how much will you be doing? Will you be tweeting out there as well? Um, how much communication? So the communication from the space station these days is really very good. I have the opportunity to call uh, anybody at any time, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do. So uh, I can talk to my family on a daily basis. Once a week, I'll um, have the opportunity to do a private family conference, it's called, so like a Skype or a FaceTime, really. Um, so that's great as well. So, so we do have good communication. And of course, I'll be tweeting from the space station as well. Are you going to be recording a music video as well? Uh, I don't think I'll be doing a music video, no. Um, Aitan, your second question. Since the new Star Wars film is coming out in December, if you could have one thing from the film, what would it be? <laughs> one thing from the film? I've always wanted to have a lightsaber, um, one that really works. So uh, that would be it. But my, my sons really enjoy Star Wars. Uh, they're age six and four, and uh, my youngest son is a huge fan of Darth Vader. So uh, I'd probably have to take up a little Darth Vader figure to the space station. Probably don't want lightsabers on the International <laughs> Space Station. You just like cleave off half of it. Um, Elizabeth, your question. What do you think finding water on Mars might mean for our hope of colonization? I think it's really exciting. You know, the, the gradual robotic ex exploration of Mars, um, following spirit and opportunity in the early days, and, and now we have curiosity and we're working towards ExoMars. It's fantastic that we're getting uh, you know, closer to uh, identifying water, organic compounds, and who knows, maybe even the possibility of uh, past or present microbial life forms on Mars. So uh, it's all leading towards a, a really exciting future where I, I'm convinced that we'll be able to colonize Mars, and that's the kind of uh, steps we're taking to be able to do in the future. So no, the, the evidence of water on Mars is really exciting, and not just for growing um, food so as a food source, but also as a fuel source as well, it's very important. Uh, Joseph. 
What do astronauts do when they're not in space? When they're not in space, well, that's a good question, Joseph. If, we're, if we've got a space mission coming up, like in myself, we train an awful lot. So for the last two and a half years, I've just been training for this mission. Uh, when we come back from a mission, we still have lots of medical data that we have to give. Lots of these experiments go on for about a year after we return from space. And then as an astronaut, you're really trying to work in the programs uh, and trying to help those who are going to space and trying to help forge the, the route ahead for our next exploration mission. So I'll hopefully be working on some of these missions that we're talking about going back to the moon and to Mars. What type of training do you do? Type of training? It's really diverse. Some of the two of the tasks we have to do as an astronaut, which are really quite um, demanding, is robotic arm operations. So every time a visiting vehicle comes to the space station, most of them just park themselves in about a 10 meter hover underneath the space station. And it's up to us to use the robotic arm to grab it and dock it to the space station. So that takes a lot of training to be able to do that. Also to do a spacewalk takes an awful lot of training. Uh, a spacesuit's like a mini space station. It's very complex and it keeps us alive for up to eight hours outside the space station. So we train a lot to prepare for a spacewalk. Ayana, your question. Do you believe that this special flight will bring important benefits to the British industry and also British science? And why should the money spent be used to address problems that the Earth is currently facing? It's a great question and already, you know, the space station is returning um, brilliant science and for other countries who've been involved in the space station program uh, have had huge scientific return, huge industrial return as well. Um, and now that the UK is part of the space station program, it opens the door to British scientists to get their experiments into space and also British engineering and British industry to also get involved in human spaceflight. Um, it's hugely important, as I said, where we're going in terms of the next generation of missions to the moon and Mars. I really want the UK to be part of those missions. We should be part of those missions. We've got a great heritage and culture in terms of exploration. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really excited the prospect now that the UK is firmly involved in human spaceflight. Are there things that have been sort of discovered or researched on the ISS or other space stations that we use every day now that have sort of changed? There are, there are sort of many applications, but really the, you know, some of the fundamental research we do on the ISS, by the time it makes its way down to you know, the products that we would buy off the shelf, many people don't realize that the initial investigations happened because it was stuff that was developed for spaceflight. Um, I mean, just take mobile phone technology, for example. An awful lot of that was developed uh, in the early days for the human spaceflight program. Um, a lot of what we're doing right now in terms of medical research is, is groundbreaking. We're looking at you know, methods of uh, encapsulation for cancer treatments for drugs. We're looking at asthma um, therapies. We're looking at growing protein crystals to try and develop drugs to counter motor neurone disease, for example. Um, so there's some really fascinating medical research. Okay, good, so it is useful. <laughs> Absolutely. Leila, um, your question. Do you know any of the other people who will be, who will be up there with you? So yes, I, I, I know Yuri and Tim very well, and we've, we've trained together, and my other crewmates on board the space station, we all know each other quite well. Um, and something we'll do up there as well is eat together. It's always a nice thing at the end of the day to uh, come together and have a, a, an evening meal. And it just gives you the chance to kind of find out what your crewmates have been doing during the day and have that social interaction. Uh, otherwise, space could become quite lonely. And it sounds strange to be lonely in a small confined space, but the space station is actually quite big. It's about the size of a jumbo jet. So six people in that volume, you know, you can go all day long, uh, not really working with anybody else. So it is nice to come together and socialize at the end of the day. Um, and you're going up there, you're going to be up there over Christmas. Yes. How do you celebrate Christmas in space? Uh, Christmas is probably just going to be a normal working day, but uh, we have got a few treats. I know a Christmas pudding is making its way up there on one of the visiting vehicles, so um, we'll probably ha have a fun meal on probably Christmas can't Day. can't set it alight, cover it <laughs> in brandy. Probably best not to. Yeah. Um, guys, just that's all the schedule questions. Are there quick fire questions you want to ask just before we finish it? Um, when our mission from Sofia is over, what are you going to do back when you're on Earth? When I'm back on Earth, uh, I'm going to try and share the mission as much as possible. So uh, hopefully I've got some exciting stories to tell. Um, a lot of the science that we'll be doing, um, I'll be sharing that as well. Uh, that science will continue. So I've got 23 medical experiments that I'm doing on my own, own body. So I'll be 
continuing to be uh, tested for those for about a year after the mission, um, and then planning for the next uh, phase of the missions as well. So helping my colleagues who are flying after me, for example, Thomas Pesquet from France, he launches exactly one year after me, so I'll be helping him and future ESA astronauts with their missions. Anyone else? Hey, um, well, when you come down into Earth, what will be your hobbies? So what, apart from the hobbies that a lot of people know you like to do, mm. how, which, how will you find time to spend, spend working and how will you manage your time? That's a great question and, and hopefully when I get back from Earth, you know, I'll have a bit of time to just enjoy what I've been missing. Um, and I love the outdoors, I love the fresh air, I love, you know, camping and hiking and doing activities as a family outdoors. So hopefully there'll be some time for that and, uh, you know, maybe I'll have a, a sort of new and slightly different perspective on life, having viewed the planet from outer space. And what do your friends and family think about you being um, an astronaut? They're really excited uh, and really supportive. You know, it, it is a long time away from friends and family and I have to travel an awful lot in preparing for the mission as well. So, of course, I miss my family when I'm away, but uh, they also um, are you know, really enjoying the experience and they're very supportive of what I do. Do you get to spend much time with your family? Um, when I'm when I'm in Houston, which is where my family live at the moment, yes, we you know we just have a normal family life, and, and I go to work each day just like anybody else. But uh, yeah, I do have to travel around a lot, so I do I do miss my family when I'm away. Uh, Elizabeth, last question. Will you ever go back up into space after this mission? I certainly hope so. Um, you know, we have a lot of missions in the European Space Agency. There's a lot of missions that are planned not just at the International Space Station beyond my mission, but also looking further ahead on lunar missions and, and possible other collaborations, for example, with the Chinese Space Agency. There's the potential for flights there as well. Um, you know, we were selected in uh, 2009. We, we worked for the Space Agency. And at that time, there were six astronauts and only five flights. And we thought that maybe one person wouldn't have a flight and maybe that flight would be 2021. Well, it's going to be 2017 and we would have all six of us flown to space. So that's a remarkable flight rate. Uh, not many space agencies have enjoyed so many astronauts flying so quickly. Um, and so the future is looking very bright for, for second, potentially third flights as well. Maybe see you on Mars quite soon. Tim Peake, thank you.